So um, I guess we can start now. We'll start with uh, Durga. I think uh, Durga, you had some uh, comments and questions. You may unmute and. Uh, Thanks, Akka. So we had some really enthusiastic responses on YouTube. And um, these are some questions that we got. So um, what I'll do is I'll name the person who has sent us the question and what uh, the question is. So we have Miss um, Ananya Mishra, who's saying my question is for both the teams. Don't both go together. When we interpret our imagination, we create. And when we interpret what inspired us, we create something personal to us. So that was her question and she would like to hear from both the teams. Thank you. I think that was her closing comment. It's, it goes together. It has to go together, I guess. Yeah, my school. I don't think that's a question. That's a statement that all of us agree to. So yeah, and also you know when Neera and I were discussing, you know what points that we could come up with for, uh, for you know both the sides, we were thinking this a uh, very interesting point. The dancer is a creative interpreter and an interpretative creator. You know, <laughs> yeah, we do both, right? And uh, and we we both sort of agree. Creation doesn't mean that you have to do something from scratch. And not doing something from scratch need not mean it's a creation. So, yeah. Um, we have a, a question from Ishan, a question or a comment. So Ishan, if you can unmute yourself and share. Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to ask something, uh, as in share something. So the Greek philosophers say that creativity is like God. And then when it comes to you, you use it to the utmost. So that's one thing. And another one is um, when I was reading through the Shastras and Puranas and, you know, a lot of um, commentaries um, on Bhashyam and Vedanta Deshika and all these people, they use an ad, a, a, a very uh, nice Tamil term called Adiyen or Dasan, which means they are surrendering to the supreme power. And they also say we are the representative of this amazing uh, creator. So as dancer, I, I might not say we are the creator, but why don't you think we are the representative of that creator and we're kind of appreciating the creation. So we are an interpreter and creator because without, uh, you know, God can't be everywhere. Like, uh, you know, as uh, Advaita quotes, uh, we are the part of the creation and we are creation itself. And don't you think in order to appreciate the creator, uh, creation creator has to take different forms uh, that's it very true i mean i think uh, one thing that i should add here is uh, instead, instead of using the uh, the word you said representer or you're representing god i think with a medium we always call ourselves the medium like how we have an acrylic medium and an oil medium right where it without the rendering of that particular medium you don't have a painting at all similarly we as a certain purusha adian we, we are people who are the medium through which this certain Ishwara Anugraha, whatever, comes through with us. And that's why all of us, uh, through a uh, lot of us have skill, a lot of us have uh, a lot of skill, right? And uh, that, I, I've seen that in very few people. I've not seen it in myself. I've seen it in very few people. So I think uh, that's that's very important. And it's, it's no, I don't think it's any lesser to be, like Harini said, I don't think it's any lesser to be, uh, an interpreter or any greater to be a creator it, it, it's not like that we're all doing our our bits it works for us we do it so i think uh, that's that's very important to also remember we can just be mere interpreters we can just do the same thing we that's been done a hundred times so mahati uh no, when when uh, he said uh, you know we are supposed to be representatives of the higher power um I was reminded of something a friend of mine said. He he had he was talking about a book, uh, a small book that his spiritual guide had written, uh, and he was mentioning how it, uh, as as an introduction to the book itself on the first page, that that uh, the particular Mahan had written that all uh, all the good things about this book are are by the grace of. Yes of God and all the faults are my own. So why I was reminded of this is when we represent someone, we try to be our best. You know, we try to show the good side of whoever we're representing. All the good things about the person that we are representing 
is important here we don't generally uh, you know that's why we say that it's a responsibility when we are representing someone it's a responsibility when we are representing our guru it's a responsibility on us when we representing uh, an an organization that we are part of so yeah it's just a little uh, something that a memory that i was reminded of when he said we are representatives of uh, the higher power i mean i was just thinking that you know being a representative comes with a lot of responsibility too as mahati was saying and um, i'm just thinking aloud here you know just because we are an artist or a poet or a dancer can we just claim to be representatives are all of us representatives again that who is the chosen representative when we were discussing and we had chance to talk with uh, jay chandran sir so he was talking about uh, the stamba like the flag post of uh, i think it's for it some from his talk talk some talk i guess yeah so stamba the flag post how it connects the heaven and the earth the circle and the square that is how our uh, you know spine is when it is aligned in a particular way and at the right moment we are able to make something irrational rational to the people so we are or can be representative but we have to be ready or artistically you know aligned or to be it you know that's what I, yeah Good. this one is it thank you uh, mira uh, now if i can uh, go back to durga if you have some question or comment from uh, youtube that you'd like to share yes so there was um what i understand to be interconnected linked questions from miss veda annam raju she says where does one draw the line writers don't invent language are their books just interpretations of language when does something become a creation and not just an interpretation and then uh, a little while later we had another question joining in saying considering the grand scheme of things we as earthlings experience aspects of the same world how different does an interpretation have to be from the source to be called a separate creation and she would really like it if both the teams teams weighed in on this thank you i just have a question or uh, just a clarification before all of us answer are we still two separate teams uh, no are we all no, we're not happy family right now <laughs> this is free flowing mahati you can you can okay. thank god thank you <laughs> <laughs> so i think uh, i have an answer for the first part so yeah even I, that's what even i was saying you know uh, when we say that jayadeva wrote geeta govindam we cannot not call it a creation you know and even bartrahari says that a sentence is independent of its words the words have separate meanings in themselves and when when it comes together as a sentence it is a new sentence you can't say that you know, it's an interpretation of these words right so it, it is a creation on its own and um, the basic uh, point that we have here is creation does not mean making something out of nothing there is nothing called nothing right so there has to be to create so it doesn't have to be a creation from nothing and a sentence is a new creation in itself even though it is made out of words yeah but i i think adding to that very true harin in the west mm-hmm. sense, it is very true that we call all these a creation but just adding to that we attribute this aspect of creativity to ishwara because it's never something that is 100% original see right yeah. it, it doesn't like you said there's nothing like there's nothing Mm. So nothing that is hundred percent unless you are that the the seed that bija of uh, of the first ever creation that has happened you can never create out of any of 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 that so maybe uh, it, it's just an attribution of whatever you do to each other because you know that you're actually removing it from reality just a little bit even if it's uh, uh, if, if if it's dragons right they're mythical completely but they have. uh features of different uh, animals are uh, are uh, yakshas have features of different beings uh, right i mean uh, am i am i not am, are you trying to understand it so it's it, it it has to come from somewhere which so therefore though it is a creation but uh, do you call it really one in our context uh, in the indic context so yeah i mean that's th- those are questions and 
yeah i think also where you draw the line is very subjective and uh, i just adding on to that and also sharing on to the question as to you know the subjective uh, perspectives of the world you know we're all living in the same world but we're all each of us are seeing it in a different way um i'm just thinking out loud here um because with the whole discussion about nothingness i'm just wondering are we so um are we so taken in by are we so used to seeing something or the other uh, throughout our life from birth right till the end that we find it nearly impossible to imagine nothingness mm-hmm. thus because when there is because nothingness and something right cannot exist without each other there needs to be something if you have to have a nothing so again just thinking out loud here um are we so used to because of our subjective realities because of how each of us view the world in our own ways and because we always have something you know we we have this some, so, so common for us to say oh there's something always running in my mind is it because of that something that's always running in our mind that we find it so difficult to think of nothing so i guess it's just uh, Too philosophical. Yeah, I can't help it. Nine o'clock in the night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have uh, Divya Ravi, who's uh, who has our next question, and she says, uh, not on an atheistic note, but when one reads books like *Sapiens*, one can't ignore the point of view of evolutionary biologists that everything, including God, art, culture, etc., except nature, is all a creation of in the human mind a result of human cognitive revolution curious to know if this aids the arguments of team 1 and if team 2 has rebuttals for that actually you know this is not at all an atheistic i uh, mean atheistic uh, observation because i think the verse in dakshinamurthi stotram it says vishwam um, what is it darpana drishyamana nagari right so the world is a mirror of your mind so yeah i think it it does because um i think it aids in our argument as well right i mean in the <laughs> sense that uh, see right now when we look at creation or the creator the problem is when you look at god from the western aspect it is very different from the the, the aspect of uh, god in the indian indic in indic culture those cultures that were originated from here correct mahati so, yeah i was actually thinking the same thing in fact i was uh, reminded of the exact same point that manish and i were having a discussion on about 2 years ago yeah correct uh, we did we were talking about this point as to where you know this this whole thing about whether god the concept of god is a human creation or uh, you know if if man created if if god created man then who created god you know that big question um i so this is how i understand it originally like how uh, harini said it is not at all an atheistic concept it is quite quite frankly uh, again so just to in my in my limited understanding um and again i am able to talk only from the point of view of you know indic tradition because that's what i'm most familiar with um and i do agree with what manas said as well the concept of god itself is so different in uh in indic traditions in in the indic uh faith faith that have originated here uh so different from concept of god in uh say other parts of the world Here, has a very different understanding than adi shankara yeah so here we have so if we look at inception right where did this whole concept of god start off in india then we usually trace it all the way back and say oh you know the oldest this thing is in the vedas it's in the rig vedas what are what is the rig veda it's essentially hymns to nature and the concept of god as we know it today is this higher power sitting somewhere but nature is not a higher power sitting somewhere it's the higher power that you see all around 
and you are a part of that power you are a part and parcel of nature you are a part of that you are if i can use a, i'm not a student of biology i'm a, i'm terrible at the subject but if i may I know biology is okay term, yeah if i may use this term essentially human homo sapiens are another species living on the planet so what do we really consider as god uh, really does vary from faith to faith i guess so and uh, yeah fun. this uh, the idea you can attribute anything even to your uh, you can attribute uh, you can also call pratibha shakti ishvara you can call and you can call your uh, surya ishvara you can call uh, apaha ishvara everything is ishvara for us in the end so the problem is we are not able to say that there is only one god the, for us everything is ishvara in all in, in including your sikhism and your uh, they play great a book the saib uh, that is there so sikhism jaina buddha everything looks into there is a certain philosophical process and there is a certain bhavana where we look at everything as ishvara it's not just one ishvara so uh, like i said uh, it's it's a lifestyle where we learn to revere everything that is what is important in our culture and that's that's the uh, that's the whole idea of ishvara where you revere if you're calling it a sort of like a, something that that's we made up yeah i think it's good to revere everything you'll be able to use your resources lesser everybody is turning the vegan way everybody is saying they're having an awakening a karmic awakening and getting into the vegan way uh, including divya and uh, she is she's a vegan so yeah i mean i guess that's just how uh, it is if reverence is something that is man made then i think it's good so yeah and again because we keep saying ishvara ishvara may not be called ishvara in the definition of who a god is so the name changes and definition changes i guess so it's quite a that's that's a, it's, it's a different topic it's a topic for a completely different yeah we'll have thing. another debate on that <laughs> Uh, if puna can you will yeah, have a counter to all this i'm sure no counter just but to quickly add because you were you know talking about the uh, indic culture this is also the culture that allows for a uh, very um, proactively allows for atheistic thought as well right that's very much part of the uh, the philosophy the body of philosophy as well so it's a very interesting uh, thing to think about and i think uh, that's true of actually because i think the very meaning of the word atheist itself has changed so much over time so in today these days we we associate the word with something completely different originally it just meant somebody who did not believe in a higher power called god theo who did not believe in the concept of theo you know who did not believe in that higher concept and that i think necessarily does not mean that it's uh, they don't believe in worshiping nature as a higher power okay sorry so, may yeah. i butt in here just a minute can you hear me now this is divya can you hear me now yes, so i i think my entire question was not at all about atheism or god at all for that matter it was just to say that these ideas if you look at it from the perspective of evolutionary biology the very idea of even art and culture for that matter are all human creations uh uh you know uh, except nature nature is not created by human technically unless it's another human so i think uh, the whole point was i mean i just said not on an atheistic note but the whole point of my question was not at all about atheism or god at all for that matter it was just to say that uh, if you look at it from an evolutionary biologist perspective all of this itself is uh, a result of human creation human human thought uh it is um, it is a creation in the thought of humans and that's because of cognitive revolution so i was curious yeah. to know if this would be an argument that harini and um, um um mira would use and if there's any rebuttal for this i think that okay even art is a creation would would you have a rebuttal for that that was that was the whole point of the question i'm so sorry <laughs> divya yes i understood your question and i'm just trying to say that no actually this doesn't support our argument because of the main loop hole here that creation does not happen in the mind you know the critics clearly say that creation happens only when there is no mind and no thoughts that's the time when the creation happens so again i don't think we can uh, you know connect this with the idea of creating art that's beautiful okay thank you for that i i was just curious to know but that's a beautiful uh, thought 
Um, but we'll continue, Shilpa, if you want to uh, unmute and um, share. We can hear. Yeah, hi, everyone. It is a beautiful conversation to listen in on because there were so many points made. And um, I don't have questions as such. But it was an observation because I resonated with certain points made by um, Harini and Meera, uh, especially the point about uh, when a child is born, a mother is created, because uh, uh, every mother would have experienced that. You never knew that existed within you. You do not have any control over it, but it just happened. And that also moved into the point made by Harini, which um, Harini said that the I doesn't exist. Uh, when the creation happens. And he terms it as a loophole, but for me, it was actually, I mean, through personal uh, experiences of what has, what has happened in my journey as a dancer, I felt that this is what um, had kind of um, uh, been a central focal point for me. And uh, just to give you a sm small anecdote of what happened is that sometime back when I was dabbling in uh, choreography, I was choreography for the first time all by myself. And I thought, oh, here I am, I'm creating something, I'm creating something. And that's when I paused and I thought, it doesn't feel like I'm creating, so what is happening? And I had this kind of heart-to-heart -heart that all of you are having over here. I did that with a close friend of mine and arrived at this conclusion that it isn't me creating. Creativity as such or creation as such lies within the form. The form has been created in such a way that it is flexible enough, the fabric of the form is flexible enough that allows us as dancers to just create different weeds within it and put in our input. So uh, it, that was something that I, I just randomly arrived at and uh, it's sitting in the same. So just thought I'll share with all of you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Shilpa, for sharing that. That was beautiful. Uh, we have time for just one more question and I'm going to have Durga kind of share uh, maybe something yes. from the live stream. Yeah. Um, Akka, we actually have two really interesting questions um, that have just come in from YouTube. So we have one from um, Shreyas and Shreya. And they say, as a dancer, as said, there are various responsibilities one needs to uphold in being a representative. But can we draw a line or a restricted separation between creating something and interpreting something? And is a dancer obliged under certain constrictions and terms to create or interpret something? I was just doing this one presentation on, I was writing a paper on ethics and art conservation, right? And uh, I, I actually specialize in intangible art conservation, anything that can be felt or seen or, or heard or experienced uh, physically. Uh, but I think as a, uh, as intangible art conservators, right, there are three rules that are very important in ethics. First is the vision of the past, right? Second is how the future looks at it, right? And third is your own interpretation because, see, it is passed down to you from the past. It's very important to respect the past, number one. And then you need to also, you're responsible. See, you, just because it's your own creativity, drawing a, a moustache on Mona Lisa is not right. It may be okay now because of women empowerment and you say that body hair is okay. It's completely all right. But then how is the, is the future's, uh, future's uh, vision of it will probably be very, very skewed, right? Nonetheless, you should be able to have the cake, eat a little bit of it and then pass it down. You just can't say, you, you can't have the cake and eat the cake, right? You have the cake, you probably eat the frosting and uh, the nice bits <laughs> or the cake itself and give a part of it. So I think that's something very, hello? I, I think you can, hear, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so that, that's, that's my interpretation of this. And uh, I don't know, this is, this is ethics of conservation, which I think is very, very valuable. So you need to be able to respect all these things. And one more thing is humility. Enter it with humility. So yeah, so that's about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess then uh, with this, we are all out of time today. Um, we I want to first thank uh, Harini, Meera, Manaswini and Mahati for being here with us today, uh, for actually taking the time to prepare such beautiful and strong arguments. Uh, as we said in the very beginning, one of the goals was to lay everything out and to look at it equally, you know, 
And I think uh, I can say safely that we have been able to do that today. I also want to um, thank the audiences, uh, those of you who've joined us on Zoom and also via live stream on YouTube. I want to thank you for being here with us, spending this time with us. Uh, if you're in India um, on a Sunday evening and if you're here in the US uh, on a Sunday morning, it means a lot to us, uh, your support uh, for us to carry on our projects. Uh, please continue to support and follow Rooted and uh, we hope to be back soon with something more exciting. Uh, if I may just add uh, yes. some closing comments at least on my side. Um, first of all, yes, thank you so much for um, inviting us to be a part of this, uh, this lovely initiative. Um, I am not a debater. I, I've never debated in my life. Uh, I have always kind of chosen a very, uh, if I can say it, a very uh, passive, more diplomatic approach to things because I I am not one for, you know, I'm more for, you know, you have your point of view, I have my point of view, we accept each other's point of view and we're happy, everyone's happy. So I'm more that kind of a person, but this has really been an eye-opener because, um, like Harini said, though we all knew the answer to things, it kind of gave us a chance to look at a different perspective, a perspective different from our own. And uh, I think all of us are going to leave this session just at least a little bit wiser uh, than before. A little bit. We are all taking. There's always going to be some takeaway from this, uh, small or big. It's still a takeaway, and uh, it's. It's. It, I'm sure it's going to. At least for me, it's definitely going to. Um, uh, change the way I look at certain things, uh, change the way I uh, approach certain things as an artist. So thank you so much for this. Thank you, Mahati. And I just want to add that... Uh, thank you. Um, even for us, like I... I have in moderated debates, uh, but I think uh, it's very important today more than any other uh, time because as dancers, we become so comfortable using our bodies to communicate. Uh, we need to start using our voices too because uh, <laughs> it's really important when we are talking about certain issues. So um, thank you again. Uh, thank you everyone and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.